reasons. One, it's eight o'clock in the morning. Yeah. You can hear the brass play that high. And, get up there. <laughs> and also, I think one of the things that's so helpful for us as conductors is just having an opportunity to make music with live people and to get a little bit of that experience and flow. And so, uh, it's better to just work on that and stop every two bars. So, Brendan, what are the primary responsibilities of a conductor and, as, and you specifically as, as a conductor? What do you think your primary responsibilities are for your colleagues? Uh, I think of it as like a three-tier system, first of which is making sure all rhythms, notes, and key signatures and everything is paid attention to. Thankfully, with this lovely ensemble, I don't have to worry about that. Uh, second is to instill a little bit of musicianship and growth into the music, making it phrase shanked and all of that fun stuff. Uh, and I think it, I did a pretty good job of that. And then third is bringing it to like this new plane of different experience and making it just feel musical and feel super involved and emotional in the whole Okay, those are, those are good goals. Yeah. From a uh, perspective of, the, of our constituents, what was Brendan's primary piece of information that he was giving you through that week? What did you get more of from him than anything else? Time. Say it again. Time. Time. Okay. Would you agree with that? Everybody else? Okay. Does that surprise you? No. Okay. But you didn't really, but time was not a huge factor in what you were talking about. You had these three and four things that were all very beautiful goals. Yeah. But it wasn't like my primary responsibility is to keep time for everybody. You didn't say that. No, it, it shouldn't be, but it turned out. That okay. So we have a disconnect. Yeah. Right? So. That's what we're gonna work on in your time. Absolutely. Okay. So, but before we get there, from a time perspective, our responsibility is to set the time and to embody the time. When you came in and out of your time, sometimes you were out of time coming back into it. Mm -hmm. So very important when you watch this video that when you come out of a beat pattern to shape some music, that when you come back to the time, it is exactly where it should be. The train is moving, mm -hmm. and if you're gonna jump off and walk beside it, you gotta jump back around at the exact time space. Time space. Okay. Let's go back to, let's actually not go back to the beginning because I want everybody to play. Let's go to let's let's do D at the beginning of this kind of slow build. -up. And I want you to just without giving you any other feedback, I want you to just focus on the phrase. I want you to focus on making music over the course of each of these eight-bar phrases as you get the iterations and variations of the chaconne, and then focus on the long phrase and where is the culmination of that long piece of music that's happening. You don't need to be in a pattern necessarily. I want you to embody the time. Mm -hmm. But listen to the time that they're giving you. If it's good, then you don't need to dictate it. Show them where you want this to go and how you want that, that texture and that sound to, to be realized. Sure. Yeah, right at D. Pick up to D.
engage. We want to facilitate. Our job as conductors is to facilitate something musical that's interesting. Sometimes it's time, sometimes it's phrase, sometimes it's dynamics. But if we're facilitating, we have a couple of jobs. One is to not be inhibitors. So I rarely will do this to an ensemble. If you want them to play softer, just make your body softer. You know, find a way to just kind of settle, rather than, no, no, no it's too loud, right? Because mm -hmm. we're facilitating. We can encourage without discouraging, mm -hmm. I guess. The other thing is to stay open. Yeah. So your general carriage, Brandon, if you watch video, is I'm gonna get up here and say, yeah, you, you have a little bit of a kind of, the shoulders are a little closed, and sometimes when you want something, you kind of, there's an intensity here, mm -hmm. the emotion is there, but it's a little closed. And I think we are better when we open ourselves up to let the sound kind of come to us here. So you can be soft and subtle, but still kind of be receptive to what's happening. Two minutes. And we're gonna to go to the end here. And the other thing I want you to do as you are remaining open and you're engaged and you're just enjoying the flow of this phrase and meeting them at every iteration of the Chacon, as it builds, you become more and more open. Okay. So by the end of this, when the snare drum comes in and eventually we get to the cymbal crash, I would like to see you as open as you have ever felt in your life and that sound is just hitting you here. And then, you're also not gonna need to look at the score. Yeah. Because in the, when you watch the tape, when you did the run through, the last three or four bars, mm -hmm. where you know the music and it's the most open and the most like illuminated, you were kind of <laughs> like, oh, oh look, there's a, there's a last note here. That's the last note. You know where the last note is. Mm -hmm. So find a, a connection with them. You don't need this. Yeah, you've got it. From D to the end, sure. open, phrase, sing, make music, and then let this be glorious at the end. All right. <laughs> Oh, oh, don't prep the prep. Don't prep the prep. So you hear? You're already kind of moving. The music's already happening. Lead on down. Sure. Uh, well, let's do. Let's
notes to get to the end. One, two, three, four, five, six. six Last six bars. I know we got to stop.
did it get better or, or worse as you went through as far as ensemble and people staying in general? I feel like it got a little worse, actually. Really? Okay. Uh, what else did you hear? Away from the time. What did you hear as far as the sound of the ensemble, um, the spirit, the kind of phrases, articulation, things like that? I feel like we started pretty, like, you know, excited and initiatives, and then it just kind of got complacent. They got like, complacent as we went. It kind of lost the energy and the excitement. Was any of that your fault? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good answer. Good answer, man. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, this is the, the negotiation between what we want to hear and what we actually hear is always an interesting one. Uh, how much of it is what we can do to help encourage an ensemble, how much is an ensemble, and it's the constant interplay between what we're doing and what we're hearing and how we adjust what we're doing. I think what you want to hear can be achieved through some tweaks to just how we approach the music both in time and in energy and in articulation. One of the things we want to spend our time on is the idea of placing versus releasing. So in fast music sometimes, there's, we have, a, we have a, a habit, all of us have a little bit of a habit of kind of, kind of placing and dictating this kind of, you know, dictus heavy kind of an approach. Even when we're all of breath, sometimes we can be consumed with the time just kind of like this. Releasing is, Acti having an activating gesture that then allows the music to bounce off of it. So I'm only going to say that. I want you to start this again, and I want you to see if you can just put a little more bounce and release into your gesture rather than trying to actually textbook-wise conduct a, a scherzo 2-4, right. right? Just release the music of it and see what that feels like. Maybe you are. 
but there's an intensity to your to what you're showing them in your face, and that's a concentration of like, you know, here we go. But I think it is antithetical to the spirit of what you're hoping for. So our face and our carriage and the way that we approach the beginning of a piece, just for the way we raise our hands, which I thought you did a pretty nice job. You didn't do the, you know, you kind of were here and you raised your hands and you went. But the face was kind of, rather than kind of embodying the character of what we're about to do together, that makes a huge difference. So if you can tap into the feeling of what you feel about the beginning of this piece, just the spirit and character of it, try to show a little bit of that, even through your glasses. Those of you who wear glasses, it's tricky because you know eyes are really important. And you get, they get to see your eyes through the glasses. But your mouth, your the carriage, your forehead, all of that can kind of embody a little bit more. And that can also change the way your gesture looks because if you feel it in your face, you're gonna do something different here. One more thing, I'm gonna go through the, the, the central plan that's solo. Uh, is that you're doing this olive breath thing, ba -di -da, -ba. you're just doing it for those two bars. I'm not sure that it's necessary. You could do the whole thing olive breath, but picking a bar or two to always do olive breath, I don't think it makes so much of a difference. And in fact, it just has the potential to kind of mess with the time a little bit. Since the central section of this is essentially a cut time, I would say it. Okay. Because one of our jobs also is to be interesting for the music. That's how you look at us. If we're not interesting, or worse, we're actually hurting you, you're not gonna watch us. So our job is to not hurt, like a doctor, but also to be interesting enough in what we show, in the variety of what we show, that they will they will tune in so that we can have a collaboration. So if you do that same thing all the time and it doesn't really have an effect, it's probably worth eradicating and saving for something else. Okay, so baton in, loose, bouncy, more joy in your face, and then let's get all the way through the central clarinet section. We'll talk a little bit about that middle section before we adjourn.
concentrating, and you're working really hard, you've studied this piece, I think allowing yourself a little more joy, a little more connection here and with your body is going to change the way you conduct. I think rather than being textbook about, I've got to do this, I've got to do this, I've got to do this, allow the music that's inside you to come on a little bit more for, for your colleagues and then see how that affects your gesture. Because the technique is fine. You know, there's a lot of refinement and things you can add to your technique, but the basic technique is fine. I think they want to see a little bit more of you and your musicianship and that flow, that flow that comes through your gesture. Okay? Okay, good. Well done.
know, but I've got time. I mean, I, do you, uh, does everybody have classes? Yeah, we have classes. Oh, oh my gosh. gosh. <laughs> At 9 o'clock? Yeah, so five minutes for a couple of questions. Yeah, a couple of questions. Yeah, yeah. yeah Jerry. What's the first thing you do when you start source studying a piece that you've never seen before? Uh, pray. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm always interested in finding out what a piece has to say. You know, so I try to resist the temptation of getting into the nuts and bolts. I think this is a player too. In the nuts and bolts of the details until I really understand what the piece is about, what the whole architecture is. Part of it is function. So I conduct so much music in my job that I've had to get very efficient at studying so that I can do a lot of things on short notice. So I've always kind of studied macro and micro. I've always had this kind of sense of, okay, if I had to do this tomorrow, what would I need to know about the piece, about the way it's constructed, about the major points? Be able to get through it, and then the more time I have, the more I focus in on all the little details. So it's always big to small. It's kind of uh, I try not to get mired in the weeds of like I'm going to spend this next two hours studying these first five pages. I'd rather spend the two hours going through the piece like six times, and then each time going through just a little bit slow, so I can catch more details. And that that's the best way I absorb it. But I think it's a very personal project too. And the whole idea, Ben and I were talking about this on the road, is is to absorb the piece to the maximum uh, of your ability. And that's a very personal thing. So everybody does it a little bit differently. So that's my general process. Yeah. So how did you get started with the military bands, and what drove you to be in them? Uh, my entry into the military bands at President Sarr was a, a kind of an accident. I never had this idea that I'd be a military musician. I didn't even think I'd be a professional player. That wasn't my intent. I went to school for music ed. I was going to be a band director. Um, I took the audition kind of on a whim. I mean, I practiced for it, but I, I just saw it. I was on a tour with another group uh, this the summer after, between my student teaching and my senior year coursework. Saw the audition, I had three weeks. I was more curious than anything else. I thought that President's own, that's famous. It would be crazy if I got into that band. So I went and I just took a chance and I, there was no pressure because I didn't expect to win. And when I won, I was very surprised. So that changed the course of my career. So instead of going into teaching or in grad school right away, I wanted to be a professional clarinetist, which was amazing to be in that group. And I grew so much as a musician immediately. I remember my first rehearsal, sitting down, George Washington Bridge, Leonard Slotkin conducted. I sat in the third clarinet section, my first rehearsal, and the band just started to play. And I had never heard anything like that in my life. It was all around me. Like, what did I just stumble into? And then I got lucky because then I had opportunities to conduct in the band, and then an audition came up to be one of the assistant directors, and I took that audition, knowing that I said, what the heck, when I took my clarinet audition, and I won that audition for whatever reason, and that started me on the path to be director. But if I had, if you had talked to me in college and said, hey, how would you like to be the director of the Marine Band someday, it would have been ridiculous. Like, you don't just make that plan. You just walk through the open doors as they arrive, and you just try to be as prepared as you can be for those opportunities when they come. But I'm so glad I did, because the military lifestyle, and like the tradition and the history and the discipline and the culture and the esprit de corps, as we call it, the kind of surrounding around a mission, everybody doing what they can to really execute this thing together, that spoke directly to me. I just didn't know it at the time until I actually got into the Marine Corps and, and could live it in every day. Yeah. Yeah. So how long did it take you in your career, especially as a director, to start feeling comfortable on the podium. That was probably the biggest thing I noticed between like a student level conductor and you is just like the ease that you kind of portrayed up there and felt seemingly. Thank you, first of all. Um, <laughs> I don't always feel comfortable, even after 26 years of doing this. Um, experience counts for a lot. This is why in a conducting program it's so important to do what you do for our conductors, to give them a chance to experiment, to be vulnerable, to try things, to get time on the podium and, and real live interaction with people actually making the music. So I've had 23 years of experience conducting professionals. I promise you I did not look like that or feel comfortable in my third, fourth, fifth year of being a director. It took me probably about five years to get to not be nervous every time I stood up in front of my colleagues because I was responsible for their time and for you know helping to guide the music, music making and to make sure I was I was technically proficient to not you know I, I always joke I went from being a pretty good clarinet player to a pretty mediocre conductor <laughs> instantly and it took me many years to kind of feel like I had enough skill to actually do it so about five years of, and that was every day with professionals Le learning to be a leader is just as important it's not just this. It's how do we talk to people? It's how do you empathize and relate? How do you take care of people in the leadership position? That's almost scarier than leading a band through a piece. 
because that's almost more important, uh, the way that we go through the music making process. And that takes reps as well. Just takes a chance to be in front of people and, and make mistakes, learn from them, figure out what works, and then build on that. Yeah, and I think especially going up upon your leadership, you talking to whoever about not discouraging. You know, yeah. you don't want to ever discourage something. You want to I mean, encourage something else. The other thing I, I tell uh, student conductors, and I, I told Dennis when we were driving over here for the hour, is language matters. And of course, language always matters. We know that. But the language, the way that conductors connect with musicians matters. I try really hard never to say, I want, I need, I, 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 I. It's could we try? What if we did? It's this idea of collaboration and experimentation. Yes, we are leading, we are dictating to a degree the, the, the kind of musical process, but at the end of the day, it is, it is a process that we go through together. And our decisions may not be the best ones. How many times have you come to the podium with an idea as you've studied about how you want this piece to go, and then the band does something organic together, and you rethink kind of what sounds best, what tempo is going to work best, what balance works best. So if you came to the, to the podium always with the idea, this is how it goes, not only will it turn off your, your constituents, but also it may not actually be the best music making. So having that open mind and that open idea of collaboration and guiding and facilitating rather than dictating is something that you have to learn as well. Because you gotta practice, you gotta exercise those muscles. It's so easy to reflexively be like, I, I need you to play soccer. Which is not wrong, but it just sounds a little not collaborative, right? It's the same thing as, I need you to play soccer. It's like, what if we just let this settle, right? What if we just did this really softly? Let's see what that does to the music. That's a whole different type of, of dynamic we have there. Literally. Yeah. <laughs> Give me one final one question. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, um, how do you decide whether or not to mirror with your left hand? I don't. Um, I, I don't consciously think about what I'm going to do with my left hand, but that's after 23 years of experience. Um, mirroring is not bad if it's reinforcing a certain type of music. It's only ineffective if you do it all the time, because then it becomes superfluous. I mean, you can do what you need to do with your guitar hand without that. I am left-handed, so I have a little bit of, of an advantage already that my left hand's a little more autonomous from the beginning, but I have worked very hard to make sure that whatever I do with my right hand, I can do with my left hand and vice versa. We need to be totally ambidextrous as conductors. So you get that independence, and the left hand does not become irrelevant. The left hand has so much power, both in time and expression. So when I catch myself mirroring for too long, if I notice it, I will stop it. I will change planes, and we were talking about this in the car with Ben, change planes, get them in different areas so you have different things to look at, different dominance that, you know, if I want something that's really expressive, I'm gonna make the left hand more important than the right, rather than this. Also, there's a bi this is technical speak, but there's a bilateral nature to our bodies. If you're mirroring, you're stopping in the middle. You've, you've removed 50% uh, of your expressiveness. If you mirror, but you mirror in different planes, you've now opened up a whole different level of expression. Some conductors teach that this left hand belongs here, right hand belongs here. I do not. I believe that there is a geography, but there is, this is all available to you. So that's, in a nutshell, that's kind of what I think about. I think the left hand is incredibly powerful. I spent a lot of time on left hand technique in my own teaching with, with my students. So. Okay, thank you very much. Everybody.